a podcast listener. Even if you are alone in your entrepreneurial journey, know that today, right now in your earbuds, you are joined by thousands of entrepreneurs from all around the globe seeking to grow better, more profitable, location-independent businesses. If you'd like to learn more about what we do and download our entire back catalog, check out tropicalmba.com. Hey, happy Thursday morning. I hope you're doing well. I'm pretty excited about this one. This is why it's so nice to be a podcaster because you get to reach out to people like Patrick McKenzie. And, you know, we went long form this week. I had a gazillion questions. We went long form like a Calzumius.com blog article, if you know what I'm talking about. Patrick McKenzie from Calzumius.com has been one of my favorite bloggers for over half a decade. That's like six or seven years now I've been reading his blog. He writes long form pieces about the experience of starting bootstrap software businesses. And he does so in an incredibly articulate way. And not only that, but Patrick is an expert at optimizing for non-cash currencies. We're going to talk about what that means. You know, this used to be called the Lifestyle Business Podcast. I really admire entrepreneurs who are willing to optimize their businesses and their lives for what they want out of them and not what Silicon Valley says you should want out of them or other startup gurus say you should be doing. In this episode, we dig deep into Patrick's business philosophy how he's built a powerhouse blog that's followed by some of the most influential people in the industry. We talk about his expertise around conversion optimization and email marketing. We talk about how he's become a highly sought after conference keynote speaker and just how not to suck at giving conference speeches in general. And we talk about his experience as a long-term expat in Japan. There's just so much in this one. I hope you enjoy it, but just give you some context because Patrick's internet famous now. He's really successful with all his startups. But only a few years ago in 2010, Patrick's business at the time, bingo card creator, was making $30,000 annually. Yet Andrew Warner from Mixergy.com featured him on his show and said, the reason I'm interviewing Patrick and not all the other people that email me that are earning more is that Patrick got us all wrapped up in his story. He shared so much data with us that it was helpful. We felt like we were on his team. He's just so methodical, and I really urge you to go to his website. I think you can learn a lot. The same remains true today, and you can still learn a lot. It's at calzumius.com. We're going to mention a lot of links and resources in today's show. You can find them all, plus give Patrick and myself your comments at tropicalmba.com slash Patrick. So I started this interview by jumping right into the philosophical stuff, and we'll, we'll get to some tactical stuff later, but I asked Patrick how his views on startups and business differ from many people writing about software businesses. I guess the biggest zeitgeist, which a lot of writers slash thinkers in the business startup world say, is that there's basically one correct way to do things. And this is something that's, you know, as dangerous when I say it as when anybody else does. So feel free to take everything that I say with a grain of salt on it. For example, in the VC track, raise a bunch of money, try to IPO, shoot for the moon startup world. There's sort of a growth for the sake of growth and everything is optimized and towards that overriding uh, directive. And they have a bunch of thoughts that they have on how you should design your life to achieve that objective. Similarly, in the small businesses like us who are, are running relatively smaller businesses out of the middle of nowhere, we have much different things that we optimize for. And I think that sometimes people in one world or people with one set of views on what they want to get out of life, that when they adopt advice that is optimized for another world or another set of overriding life priorities, they don't necessarily have the happiest possible result. You were talking about this idea of having a multi-dimensional preference. That's- multi-dimensional preference space you can tell i'm a math geek (laughs) so i don't know what that means give us the idea behind the principle there let's start with a character of uh, somebody on wall street who thinks there's exactly one way that they can make you know their business or their life better they've got a number it's denominated in dollars going up is good going down is bad that's like a unidimensional you know one single dimension preference space they want dollars most of us don't have a one-dimensional preference space there's a lot of things we want to get out of life i'm not primarily motivated by money 
motivated a little bit by money and a bit more by money qua an interesting score that somewhere like between World of Warcraft gold and points in a ping pong match. But there's a lot of things that I care about more than that. Like I care about being able to make a bit of an impact in my community. I really like living in Japan versus, you know, having to live in San Francisco, which is where many of the jobs are at in my industry. I really like the ability to schedule my own days rather than having them scheduled for me. I like the ability to work on problems that interest me. There's probably another, you know, 20 things or so that go into my concoction of like, if I could reduce, you know, a slider for each of these into a number and then put those numbers into some equation describing how happy I am with my life right now, there would be like 20 sliders, each weighted differently, and each, you know, scored in some other arbitrary metric. I think we have to be sensitive of the fact that between any two people or two organizations, two ways of living that the which sliders somebody's looking at, you know, what uh, dimensions they care about are totally different. And also the relative weighting of them is totally different. So some people like really have a go big or go home mentality. They won't feel accomplished in life unless they make a multi-billion dollar business. And if that is you, you have a very restricted set of options as to what you do with life versus you know somebody that has a different set of priorities. One of the things that you mentioned to me before the call is that for someone in their early 20s, Joining a startup might not be the best thing that they can do. And I'm curious about your thoughts about that. And also, you have always struck me as someone who has an extreme amount of confidence or vision in doing things your way. Where did you get that from? And how do you even set goals now? If it's not going to be a revenue goal, what types of multifaceted goals are you going after for appointment reminder, for example? Uh, and again, this is me giving you, the listener, some advice without knowing anything about you. So feel free to discard if I'm not guessing correct stuff about you. But let's say you're young, you're intelligent, you're driven for some value of driven, and you're wondering what of all the jobs I could possibly even in right now is going to give me the most options for my future. Now, there exist people in the world who will tell you that you should get a job at a startup and work really, really hard for five years, get 1% of the company. It's going to go make a billion dollars. You get 1% of a billion dollars is 10 million. So you're set for life on money and you've got a corporate ladder ahead of you, not just at that company, but at whatever you end up with after you were, you know, number one at Facebook or whatnot. Here's my problems with that. Bracket aside the question of my problems about someone who that being attractive to <laughs> might have a different life philosophy than me. Let's say that, you know, that adequately describes what you want out of life. That is not instrumentally a good way to approach getting it. The reason is that there's a power law in startups where some bare fraction of the startups funded in any given year turn out to be Google. If you can choose to be number one at Google, choose to be number one at Google. That works out very well for everybody involved who is number one at Google. But the vast majority of people who are employee number one are employee number one at a startup that is not Google. Right. And employee number one at any of those other startup jobs is a job that is every bit as difficult, every bit as stressful, and every bit as risky as being the last founder of that startup, but it's compensated in an entirely different fashion. For example, let's say three guys, they're in the garage, they found a startup, they each split one third of the company. Once they take investment, 20% of the company is going to get allocated for their future employees, and 20% of the company is going to get uh, taken by the investors. And then each of them owns one third of the remainder, so about 20% each. Their number one employee is going to get, in most cases, 1% of the company. And they're going to get diluted down over time as more investors come in and yada yada on the, the way to an exit or an IPO. So the third co-founder is literally working next to the employee on his first day, working out of the same garage. They're eating, you know, the same terrible out-of-the-box ramen. <laughs> they're probably working the same 22 hours to wake up at 8 a.m. in the morning and to try doing it again tomorrow. They've both got no health insurance. Both of their families think they're absolutely effing crazy and nobody wants to date them. But the last co-founder is making 20 times as much and will always make 20 times as much. When there's a press hit about that company, the last co-founder gets mentioned, the first employee doesn't. When it comes to their next job, the last co-founder will forever have been the co-founder of this company, whether it goes great or it goes horrible. The first employee is never gonna be anything other than an employee at that company. Is the first employee going to be rewarded with like a CEO slot or a high ranking VP slot when the company gets big in three years? If it gets big, probably not. That's just not the way the world operates. Unfortunately, I uh, know a lot of first employees and oftentimes the first employees are literally like forced out of their job to make room for an industry veteran who has the right connections or has the gravitas they need to move up market in the enterprise space, yada, yada, yada. If you happen to pick the company right, first employee, you know, 1% of a really big number turns out great. Unfortunately, the power law means that 1% of like the number that you're probably going to end up with is probably like buy yourself a nice new car, even if there's an exit rather than uh, make you set for life. Right. So and given that that's the risk reward curve, I would suggest if startups are something that you absolutely won't be complete without, found one rather than being the employee at it. 
it's an interesting point too because if you were to take the same opportunity to a vc somebody who makes their living making these judgments they would never only make three bets over the course of 12 years which is basically what you can do as a first employee Right. Each VC has, I forget what the number is, Paul Graham has it in one of his essays, but there's X number of boards you can sit on. You know, one partner at a VC firm is basically rate limited by how many boards it can sit on at once, which is like 10. Let's say a VC firm has five partners, so that's 50 boards they can sit on, which means over the life of a fund, they can do 50 investments. There is no VC company in the world that is only limited to three investments because they know the high percentage outcome if they only did three investments was they end up with no money and they're never able to work in the industry again. Let's say you're 22 right now and you're going to spend three to five years of your life working in a company. Let's figure like in your mid 30s, you're going to be wanting to settle down, you know, work at something that's a little less all consuming than being employee number one or founder at a startup. Sounds like a fairly reasonable assumption to me. That means you basically got three slots. Mathematically speaking, if you like throw three darts at the dartboard, the high percentage outcome is that you're going to lose three times. And then, you know, you're in your mid 30s with a 15 year career history of working way too long, way too hard for not too much money and being surrounded by people who had the same thing happen to them. Okay, congratulations. Now try to get married and have a kid while having no savings and probably no hair left on your head. <laughs> okay, so let's then circle back to, we're talking about like this thing that we all know, which is sort of the startup space where we all have an idea about. Let's pivot to talk about the Kazumius approach to business. What are the goals that you track in your business? And I'm curious, I guess, specifically, you know, if you could take us to that moment when you founded Appointment Reminder, what were some of the things or the goals or the metrics that you were looking at for your new business that you might have gotten wrong the first time on bingo card? Like, why not just stick with bingo card forever? What were the things that you recalibrated when you started your next business? So a bit of background. I came to Japan back in 2004 and was working at a pair of traditionally managed Japanese companies for my first couple of years here. And the idea was eventually, you know, I'd learn good business Japanese, go back home to America, get a nice safe job at Microsoft for the rest of my life. Right. And I worked very, very hard for these two Japanese companies to the point of burnout and beyond, which is the typical experience as a salary man, as a full-time employee of a Japanese company. I, A, wasn't loving that, and B, once I was like mentally committed to, okay, I cannot possibly do the rest of my life doing this, I feel less certain about you know going back to America and becoming a full-time employee, because I think that'll just be the, uh, I was about to say a different master saying slavery, but that trivializes slavery. Um, <laughs> how to put it, like a lot changes between like J random Japanese megacorp and Microsoft, and yet not all that much changes. They have a different language where they explain the terms of the agreement in, but the agreement is largely the same. Like we own you, we're going to buy your time, but fundamentally we own you. I'd had this, you know, vague idea for a while. Oh, I want to start a business someday. But given that I was full-time employed at the time, I didn't think I could do anything like quote unquote, like a real business, like all these businesses that I was reading about on the internet, you know, that the 37 signals or the fog creeks of the world, a real business with an office and employees and a product that actually did really important stuff. But I thought I could probably make software. I read actually a blog post. This might come in handy in a couple minutes. So I wrote a, read a blog post by this guy named Brian Ramison. He had made skeet shooting scoring software. So there's like this game played with uh, clay ducks and guns in the US. That's a very American game. Requires guns. Anyhow, scoring it is not exactly trivial. He made this way that you could score it on your laptop and he sold like $2,000 of the software. At 20 bucks a pop. And I thought, wow, here's a guy who he isn't going all in. He isn't raising venture capital. He isn't getting himself an office on Broadway like Fog Creek has, but he still made a business selling software. And that was something that was literally not even on my radar screen as possible prior to hearing that. Well, I could do something like that. So anyhow, I founded this bingo card creator company and ran that for a few years, got pretty decent at the mechanics of marketing it online, like SEO, email marketing, yada, yada. After I quit my day job in 2010, I was looking for something like you know, what's the next step after Bingo Car Creator? Now, Bingo Car Creator, by the way, it's primarily business to customer. So just in general, if you're doing a solo business, don't do B2C products. It makes your life much, much more difficult than it needs to be. Because businesses have money and are used to spending it, and customers don't and aren't. So it's like, okay, I'm going to make a B2B business. And it'll be selling software online, because selling software is what I like doing and what I'm really good at. Thought process so far, so good. I also did something that I always do, and it's always the wrong idea. I always like look for products that I can make easily without necessarily you know, working from, okay, there's a market with a need, and then figure out what I can do to address that need first. Mm -hmm. There was this company that had come out called Twilio, and they made an API that allowed you to do phone calls and SMS messages, which is something that was theoretically doable prior to them coming out, but wasn't really achievable by somebody like me. And so once it was achievable by somebody like me, 
like, ooh, my next business has to involve doing automatic phone calls, which not crazy, but not optimal. And so I filled up like three pages of stuff in the notebook about like various calls that a you know business could possibly make, like debt collection calls. Well, that's regulated. I don't want to go after that. You know, telemarketing. Well, that's sleazy. I don't want to go after that. And somewhere in those, you know, three pages of font size six notes was appointment reminding calls. And then I just randomly ran into a massage therapist in Japan who said that basically exactly it. They had a, a hair on fire up an appointment scheduling slash reminding problem. It's like, ooh, I wonder if that generalizes. So I made a demo of what would eventually become an appointment reminder that worked in the iPad. It basically took me like two weeks to write. And the next time I was in Chicago, I walked around downtown Chicago and just showed that demo to every massage therapist and salon that I could talk my way into. At the end of the demo, I asked them if they would buy it. So a non-trivial number of them said yes, so that I actually like shipped the system. In 2010, you wrote that you were considering getting an office because you were having trouble with work-life balance. And I'm curious <laughs> how you manage that balance now, but specifically with the bingo card software, you had your job, and then so you developed the system where you could come home at night, put in a reasonable amount of hours into your business and still see it grow. With appointment <laughs> reminder, if you do manage to have a very automated approach to it, how do you manage that worry that if I don't put more into this, it's going to go away or that competition is going to wipe out my business? I have never really worried about competition. Like My business has been wholesale cloned by people at least five times. <laughs> bingo card creator specifically and then there was actually somebody who, I can't believe this actually happened, but somebody went to like Odesk or one of those sites and said, I need a clone of appointment reminder done. <laughs> and the, the outsourcing firm that like bid on that, they took it so literally that they found the person who had done my stock cart that I used on the front page of the website and used the same person's stock cart for their website. Like a different photo, but clearly, you know, the same visual style and everything. And part of me is like, guys, why you gotta be like that? And the other half is like, well, okay, if you're going to be the half-baked off-brand copy of me, then I have nothing to worry about. <laughs> And in truth, I did indeed have nothing to worry about. Like, you know, the success or failure of the business falls basically totally on my shoulders rather than anything anybody else is doing. Candidly, if, if there's a problem with a point of reminder, it's been the last three years. Like, I don't really love this business. It's not something that I went into like, oh, man, advice that I wish I could go back and take. Peldy from Balsamic, when I was chatting him up about this back in 2010, I told him, yeah, this is, was October then. It's launching in December. Like, I'm launching this point of reminder thing. Uh, it's going to be great. Here's the business case. Here's what I'm going to be charging people. Here's my projections. My penalty was like, uh, Patrick, 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 stop, stop. Do you really care about the scheduling of dentists' offices and making sure their appointment no-show rate is as low as possible? I said, oh, heck no, but it's a great business. And he's like, no, no, stop. Don't do it. Don't do it. You're going to be in this for the next five years of your life. Should have listened to Peldy. Really? Uh, for much of the last three years, like there's been stuff that I should have been doing for the business that I wasn't doing just because it's like, oh, I get up in the morning and... Absolutely anything sounds like a better option than working on, you know, appointment reminder marketing strategy. I think if I had picked something that I was more intrinsically passionate about, either, you know, the space or the work to be done for it, that it would probably be 10 times better than it is right now. I wasn't wrong. It is a good business. It's knock on wood successful and I'm very happy with life. But put it this way, my next business will look increasingly less like appointment reminder. Do you have any ideas yet of what the next business will be? Yeah, I'm still planning it out in my head a little bit. So it turns out that relative to the rest of the world, I have a comparative advantage in basically making and selling software. I also have an audience of people who are interested in making and selling software. Like I had a consulting business for a little while in the middle of this, you know, worked with a couple dozen fairly large software firms, helped them sell in some cases millions of dollars more software. So I've got well-heeled people who really trust me on that subject. You know, compare that to like dentist offices. If you go into a random dentist office in America and ask, hey, have you ever heard of Patrick McKenzie? you will be like, no, who's that? He's one of our patients. So I should, given that I really love working with software businesses and that software businesses, like a certain fraction of them already know me and like me, I should really be working with them rather than working with, you know, J random SMBs. Very cool. So probably my next business will be sort of like, you know, marketing or sales technology specific to the needs of the software industry. That's what you know, I'm good at, excites me. I have insights that other people don't have, yada, yada. Speaking of that, then let's turn the conversation to talk about your blog, Kazumius.com. <laughs> I've been following you a long time, and I wasn't even a software entrepreneur. I was just interested in the way that you 
shared your story online. Can you talk about what motivated you to do that, especially given that you were very different from a lot of people? You know, your numbers were a lot smaller. You had a job mm -hmm. when you started. You know, there wasn't this big trend of people kind of just going open kimono online. What was your motivation there and what did you think would be the result when you started doing it? I absolutely did not think that eight years down the line I would be quote unquote internet famous in the software industry. What I thought at the time was one part like, you know, I'm living in Japan. I have substantially all of my professional interactions in Japanese. If I don't force myself to continue writing in English and continue speaking in English, I'm going to have a degradation of my abilities. Even in college and whatnot, uh, I did like public debate as a hobby. I was recognized as a very good writer. That was important to me. And I didn't want to come back to America in 10 years and not be able to fashion sentences to save my life. So I thought, well, you know, writing a blog will force me to do some writing, so that's good. I felt, you know, like that blog post from Brian had convinced me that running a software business was something I could do. I thought, well, maybe, you know, dropping a few breadcrumbs on the internet for the people following me would be a good use of my time. And then the uh, last reason, and if I'm being totally candid, introspection is probably the biggest is that I really, really like when people tell me that a thought that I had was very smart or that a thought that I had helped them. My face lights up when I get an email from somebody that said, hey, I read your post on pricing and we retooled our pricing grade two weeks ago and our sales are up by you know 25% for this month. I can't thank you enough. Like my day is totally made after that. So that's the biggest reason why I started the blog and kept it up for the last almost eight years. There's something you know that startup founders are always saying, you know, oh, I got in New York Times mention or I was in TechCrunch or whatever. But I think people really underestimate the impact that sitting down and sharing your experience in a few thousand words can have in the world and in your life. Are there any stories that jump out at you like from a blog post that you wrote something that happened just because you took the time to share that with the world? There's stories that I can think about for myself and for other people. I don't want to toot my own horn too much. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm a regular old guy who runs a little itty bitty company that was previously in the middle of nowhere, now in Tokyo. But despite that, there's uh, knock on wood some good to the world that's come through that. Paris Chopra, the founder of uh, VWO, which is a software company that does A-B testing in India, uh, credits like part of the existence of his company to my blog and me helping him out personally to move accounts back in the early days. That makes me very, very happy. And they're at uh, roughly a $10 million a year revenue run rate. They're also pretty public about that. I don't know, there's probably a couple of hundred software entrepreneurs that would rate me as being pretty formative to their businesses or very useful for them. I don't know, in the blogosphere, there's something called blog children, right? Where you read Instapundit and he convinces you to start a blog, so you're like his blog child. Okay. <laughs> My business has some business children, which there are people who are employed in good paying jobs, which exists in some small portion because of uh, me deciding to take a few hours a couple of years ago and write up what I knew about like marketing. That's mm -hmm. pretty awesome. So yeah, that keeps me pretty happy. If, so if I were to challenge you and say like, just so people could get a visualization of the types of things that you think are important to put on the web. That's what I said. You have to take down all of your posts, but two or three. If the heuristic or the actually the goal we're seeking is to like help other entrepreneurs or to make an impact, which two or three posts would you leave up on your site? So I think it's a question of like depth times breadth. So you want things that affect people on a very like achieve a high impact for individuals and yet are useful for as many people as possible. If you optimize things that way, there's some things that I have that are very narrowly focused like only towards people who are SaaS entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say I do a post on SaaS pricing, which I've, I got at least one of, you know, reading and implementing the advice in that can make a SaaS business like 25% better. Well, that's great, but relatively little of the people who read my blog are actually folks who are running SaaS businesses in a position where they can benefit from that advice. I'll tell you far and away the one that gets the most comments from people in terms of like, here's a number for you know, exactly how much this improved my situation in life is a post that I did about salary negotiation for engineers, huh. which is funny because I don't even think of like employed working for somebody else. Engineers is like the majority of my audience, but a lot of them read me anyhow. And so I did a blog post about salary negotiation that gets 100,000 readers a year, every year for like the last five years. Like I have a folder in Gmail of people who say, hey, I read your post and I went into my boss's office and demanded a raise and got $15,000. Thanks. <laughs> if you're ever in Calgary, Canada, I will buy you coffee, which makes me think two things. Number one, that's totally awesome. And number two, you have a very different idea of my consulting rates than I do. <laughs> Man, I would have to go back in my folder in Gmail. But I think that these days, the like running total of amount of money made from people that are just, you know, the ones that went out and told me, hey, I made this much as a result of reading your thing is like in the low millions of dollars. Now, speaking of big money, you've become a highly sought after consultant. Yeah, I did a bit of consulting back in 2010 through 2012. I don't do all that much of it anymore. 
And which post would you say would be like your flagship post that got you the attention of people wanting to work with you? Oh, I got a number one with the bullet answer to this one. It's actually not on my blog. It's on Fog Creek's blog. And the post is, our marketing is up Fog Creek and what we did about it. <laughs> Fog Creek is very of the engineers, by the engineers company. They had some opportunities for improvement back in the day in terms of like how their website and automated approaches were marketing the software. They brought me in to work for them largely because I had been active in one of their communities. And uh, Mike Pryor, the uh, president over there, uh, had a good opinion of me, partly because they have a bit of a profile in the industry and partly because, you know, we were pretty open about what we did and in rough order magnitude what it got for us as a result of doing that. Mm -hmm. The post that we did was posted to like raise their flag a little bit more in the world, but in the act of hoisting their flag with me in the byline, tended to hoist mine a little bit as well. And so probably the single biggest thing I ever did that to increase my consulting opportunities. One of the things I've talked with Rob Walling about is him keeping kind of his practice to his preach ratio or do to teach ratio at a reasonable level. And I've noticed, you know, so far you've done the same thing. You know, it's like you, know, you could basically turn into a full-time guru. You could easily just like sell information products all day long on your site about how to grow your business and stuff. Yet you seemed to stick to this practitioner mindset. Is that by design? I don't know. Partly back in the day, I spent a little bit of time for personal hobby reasons on the wrong side of the internet track you know, in the SEO world and whatnot. And so my, like, <laughs> if you say internet marketing, my dander goes up a little bit. So uh -huh. even though rationally speaking, I know I'm not one of those guys. I have an irrational fear of, you know, anytime I'm selling advice or marketing, even on stuff that, you know, I know I genuinely add value to the world in, I don't want to be like, quote unquote, one of those guys. So that's one of the reasons. Another reason is that producing software is intrinsically a fun and happy thing for me in a way that like recording video screencasts is not, which I've been pulling my teeth this year because I've had a product that has been coming out any day now for 52 weeks. Um, <laughs> but it's coming out any day now. Man, I would be a sucky businessman if I did not drop a link for that. It's at softwareconversionoptimization.com. <laughs> Anyhow, hopefully coming out by the end of the year. We had a product release of Daughter version 1.0 three weeks ago, which uh, sidetracked me for a little bit. But yeah, you know, another option for me is like, obviously I'm pretty good at this consulting thing and not to toot my own horn, but my like rack rate for the week rate at the tail end of my consultancy was like 30,000 a week. I could totally hire three folks, move out to Silicon Valley and just run a boutique software marketing agency there and make a couple million dollars a year. And that would, you know, a couple million dollars a year is great money. And there would be a bit of fun in that. Like I liked working with clients, but I don't like working with clients nearly as much as I like working on my own stuff. And that would require me living in Silicon Valley where it's one of those like nice place to visit, would never want to live there. I've lived in Tokyo for three weeks, like it a lot, two weeks in uh, San Francisco and I am ready to get back on a plane. One of the things you mentioned is that like you're big into taking advice from people that have been there and done that and all that, but you always follow the data. And as an A-B tester, I'm sure you've seen, I've been in a lot of situations that the data just went completely against your intuitions. Are yeah. there any uh, stories like that, that you can remember or are there kind of common intuitions or like heard knowledge on the internet that's just wrong? Like things that we all think are naturally things you ought to be doing as a marketer and turn out to not be the case when you look at the data. Oh, there is so much of this. So a commitment to A-B testing and following the data to where the data leads you is like a commitment to eating humble pie for the rest of your life. <laughs> you will frequently just learn that everything you know is wrong. And this is as true for me as it is for anybody else. Like sometimes folks ask me, hey, you know, I put together a website. Uh, well, you give me some ideas and I'll give you ideas. But, you know, even when folks are paying me quite a lot of money for ideas, I might be right on this half of the time and disastrously wrong half of the time. The nice thing about A-B testing is we know which half is which half. Some found knowledge. How about your navigation should be consistent across everywhere on your site because that's optimal for the user experience is one thing that's very common among designers and user experience folks. That is absolutely totally wrong. You can, you know, A-B test that particularly in your purchasing funnel. It will slash has slash often have massive impacts on how many people successfully complete purchases. And this is not something that comes from Bingo Card Creator, <laughs> although it does come from Bingo Card Creator. This comes from substantially bis bigger businesses. For for example, Amazon will quote unquote break navigation during the purchasing flow. If I tell that to designers, in as many words, Amazon has inconsistent navigation. The whole top nav and side nav disappears during the purchasing flow. They will tell me, no, it doesn't. And it has <laughs> since 1999. For the last 15 years, it's been like that because they did the effing map. Huh. People's intuitions about this sort of thing are so wrong that they will misremember the actual behavior of a website that they've used a hundred times. But that behavior like really matters. That decision is worth hundreds of millions of dollars every year to Amazon. 
it's worth you know only tens of thousands, quote unquote, only tens of thousands of dollars to bingo card creator slash appointment reminder to break navigation strategically at certain points. So you know that's the sort of thing where like using the quote unquote best practices without knowing why they're best practices is sort of dangerous to your health. Are there more best practices that you don't see working out for small entrepreneurs? So a lot of like developers, designers have accounts on 100 different SaaS products, and they think they've got a very high bar towards like signing up for one more SaaS product because that's one more account they have to manage. Mm -hmm. So they say, wouldn't it be great if I could just like start using a new service without having to sign up for an account for that? And then only if I get value out of it, then I'll sign up. So that's called gradual engagement. If you go to Optimizely, for example, one of a few sites that uses this, you can start like playing around with A-B testing your website without having to give your email address and pick a password or whatnot. I see. And then later in the funnel, you can say, okay, I want to actually save this work, so now I'm going to give you a username and password. It's called gradual engagement. Without pointing at any particular clients I've ever worked with, gradual engagement is not a win, period. <laughs> exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. It's something that a lot of people who don't run SaaS businesses think would be a major win for SaaS businesses. But hmm. it's not. It isn't virtually anywhere for anybody I've seen test it. And one of the ways that you can kind of predict that it isn't is think of the huge, like, biggest, best-in-class SaaS businesses. Nobody does it. And nobody does it for a reason. A couple Y Combinator companies like launched with doing it. If you watch things very carefully, they turn it off sometime. Here's a heuristic for you. Y Combinator companies are smart people. They've got like 100 founders on an email list together. They all share what the new working tactics are. And yet that tactic has not spread across Y Combinator companies like Wildfire. It's not because it's hard to implement. You know, any engineer that can ship stuff can ship this in two weeks. It's just that it kind of sucks business-wise. You mentioned Amazon and Y Combinator. As small business entrepreneurs, does it make sense for us to more or less just copy the designs Ooh. from best-in-class sites? And one other element while you think about that is how do we A-B test? Because, I mean, I think a lot of people that aren't used to this thing might just think, well, is it a matter of should we test a green button versus a red button? I mean, so how do you even think about how to set up a test that's going to give you good results? I think the kind of things that work for us in micro scale are not necessarily the kind of stuff that works for folks who are operating at a different scale or on a different model, like on the low touch to high touch continuum. Okay. One of the things that your listeners have been following Rob Walling for the last couple of years, which I think he's been really smart about, he's drag me and screaming too. I came at business from a very like minimally low touch perspective. I want my website and email to convert somebody into using the service. And anytime they need to email me, that's a bug that I want to fix. And that's not the easiest way to generate sales is somebody who's primary asset is being a smart person who's hooked up to the internet. I know you guys uh, talk about this all the time, like picking up the phone and uh, ringing the cash register and whatnot. It turns out that that works really freaking well. So rather than, you know, designing processes to remove all the friction, all the customer contact, all the opportunity to learn from people out of the business, you might want to tweak the knobs the other way. Maybe not introduce friction for the point of friction, but, you know, introduce opportunities to cross paths with customers more often, to talk to them about what their exact problems are. Uh, to solve that and then to like explicitly, and this is hard for me even to this day, ask them for money for it. So one of the things that actually I'm doing from next week is I'm finally bringing on somebody for an appointment reminder who will be you know, based out of the U.S. in a U.S. time zone to just you know, follow up with every person who puts in their phone number on the website and call them up and say, hey, we saw you started using the trial earlier today. How's that going for you? Do you have any questions? Let me answer them. By the way, would you like to do annual prepay? <laughs> I want to switch to email marketing. I want to ask you about that. That's one of the other things you're known about on the web. <laughs> How do people learn about A-B testing? Or of course, they can read your blog. Are there resources out there that everybody reads? Or is it just a matter of getting in the game and doing the work? So there's a lot of blog posts about it over the internet in a you know disconnected fashion. Honestly, I don't know that there's one simple place to jump into it you're a software entrepreneur. That's why I'm trying to make one. And that's not just me talking my book. That's a genuine thing. Like, I think there's literally no getting started with A-B testing guide that I could recommend. And certainly there's no like, okay, I read the getting started guide, but how do I actually apply this to my business? Right. Uh, there's basically nothing. The people who I know and I trust and are good at this, we've read the same 30 posts as everybody else did. They were largely crud. And I just jumped in with two feet and started doing it for myself or businesses that I you know, was somehow in control of. And then I you know, threw stuff at the wall and figured out what worked. In regards to email marketing, I mean, you've talked a lot about uh, lifecycle emails as well as email marketing in general. What do you <laughs> see as some of these maybe dogmas about email marketing that aren't working or what are the opportunities for entrepreneurs when it comes to email marketing? So far and away, the problem with the people that I talk to is that they aren't doing anything with it. The larger SaaS companies that have you know, 100 employees in a Marketo instance and whatnot, they have a different set of pathologies with email marketing. But in the 
quote unquote folks like us. Like the biggest problem is that, you know, you send one email when someone signs up for your site or you have a, an out of the way box somewhere on your website that lets them sign up for your newsletter, but you don't do anything or you just do newsletters. The easiest thing that I do with clients and people like us is to get them set up with just a pretty basic lifecycle email campaign where, you know, we're going to send you five, six, eight emails over the course of a month after you sign up for the service, which will attempt to educate you about the problem space and do just a little bit of sales. And that has, you know, major win for folks uh, in the post sign up scenario. In the pre sign up scenario, again, it's pretty much an I win button to set up trip email marketing, which is, hey, you've come to my website for some reason. I will trade you one thing that you will like in return for your email address and permission to give you other stuff that you will like on a you know once every two weeks basis. Let's talk about the cobbler shoes then, because you have a really cool <laughs> oh, yes. video. When you sign up for your list, the bait is great, right? And then the payoff is really satisfying too. Actually, the video is wonderful. You have a thing of you holding up a $100 bill and you act like you're going to cut it and then you don't and you talk about losing money and making money. And so tell me about... That was probably the thing I'm most embarrassed about <laughs> in my entire business marketing. But yeah, what do you, I, I did indeed do that. What happens when you get on your list? Are you going to try to sell me something or what's the? Uh, how does it work? And the reason I started doing an email list a couple of years ago after doing a blog for a while, and I still have my blog, is that this really crazy experience where somebody, many of you know of, who is definitely not Mark Zuckerberg, but Mark Zuckerberg is a convenient name as any. So let's say Mark Zuckerberg read my blog for five years without me knowing that. And then one day we happened for whatever reason to be in the same room. And he's like, dude, I've read your blog for the last five years. It was great. So it blew my mind, A, that totally Mark Zuckerberg was reading my blog, and B, totally Mark Zuckerberg would have at any point in the last like five years been ludicrously happy if I had like, you know, cold pitched him for a consulting engagement. But I did not know that, and I had the prior expectation that totally Mark Zuckerberg's time would have been totally wasted by talking to me. So I would have never, ever, ever tried to get in touch with him out of the blue. And thinking that was quite suboptimal, I thought, well, okay, I'll start putting a portion of my writing onto a quote-unquote private exclusive email list just so folks will like affirmatively raise the hand like, hey, you know, I actually like what you do. Please send me more of it. And then I'll know who should get stuff. Like if I was, you know, hypothetically pitching consulting gigs or whatnot. And so I started that back in 2012-ish, I think. So this is six years in my business, which was six years too long to wait on doing email, by the way. Anyhow, uh, so what happens if somebody signs up for an email from me? And aspirationally speaking, I try to write for my mailing list about once a month. Okay. So I have my favorite five emails that I've picked from that, which I go out to somebody on like a, you know, one week after signing up, two weeks after signing up, four weeks after signing up, six weeks after signing up, yada, yada. So that even if I'm not like actively writing email right now in November of 2014, somebody who signs up in November of 2014 still like has a warm inbox for me. And there's one like very minor sales pitch in like email number four. When I release my new course, it will have a quote unquote, going to use one of the internet marketing words that I hate. Oh God, oh no, launch sequence. <laughs> Ah, hey, there will be me, a launch sequence to a me, dedicated email list for that, but I probably won't toot my horn too much even on my main email list. Let me internet marketing you back because I've seen your emails go viral. What's up with yep. that? And when, when your emails go viral, like, aren't you like, ah, oh, man, I wish I would have put that on my blog? Or how do you follow up with that? I don't want to bore you guys too much with my email tool chain, but... Each of my emails, when it gets generated, uh, creates a little page on my website for it to live on as like an archive version. That's typically that page that goes viral because, you know, it's conveniently like tweetable and somebody can copy paste the URL, put it on Hacker News or send it to everybody in the office, yada, yada. That page has just so much I'm doing wrong. There's one thing I'm doing right. One thing I'm doing right is there's a logic in all my emails which say if this isn't going to your inbox, if it's going to the archive version. And the second paragraph, like the first paragraph is always a intro slash permission reminder. So, hey, this is Patrick. You're getting these emails because you asked for occasional updates from me. I'm making and selling software on my website. Today, we're going to be talking about blah. Second paragraph, if you're reading it on the archive version, is actually, you might not be seeing this in your inbox. It's possible that somebody had just sent you a link to this, in which case, I don't have your email address yet. But if you'd like to get something that's of similar quality to this article on about a you know once every two weeks or so basis, click here to give me your email address. And that like little five minutes of work that took to get that all rigged up is responsible for about 90% of my list growth. Wow. Um, when these things go viral. I think my email list is like 12,000 strong at the moment. 
like probably 10,000 of them came in through that like second paragraph hook. So that's what I do right with email. What I do wrong with email is that for a variety of reasons, like partly because I have too many irons in the fire, partly because I tend to write what's really, rather than writing on stuff that like fills a hole in my own business. If I have a course that I'm going to be launching soon, I should logically be writing about the topic of that course because that will attract people, yada, yada. It's not actually how I pick things to write about. I typically write about stuff where I feel it's a combination of like novelty factor for me and it's stuff that I've been working about in my own business recently, which is not necessarily the same as where my business interests are, if that makes sense. If I'm not doing anything new and fun and exciting in my business, if I'm just doing like the day-to-day grind, like shipping something that I've shipped before, but for a new product, I don't write too often. Right. Or if I'm too busy, I don't write too often. Or if I just feel like mentally exhausted, because writing is pretty mentally exhausting work, I don't write too often. And so as a result of that, you know, if I aspire to ship an email every two weeks to one month, uh, that would mean that uh, this year I would expect to ship between 10 and 20 emails and I've probably only shipped about five. If I was serious about email marketing as like a way to drive the business forward, I would sit down, take my castor oil, and force myself to write something every two weeks, right. or find a week that I'm doing particularly well and everything's firing in all five cylinders, and write something on Monday, something on Tuesday, something on Wednesday, something on Thursday, something on Friday, and then schedule those to go on in advance, which is something like technically trivial to do. But every email I've ever sent, like, you know, my finger was on the send button two seconds before it went out. My writing process is such that it is, I usually send them on a Friday. So they go out Friday morning, Japan time. I sit down, I start writing. I write about as much as I feel like I'm going to say. I do a word count. It's like 8,000 words. Okay, probably shouldn't. <laughs> Should keep going. Then I, you know, do one editing pass and then boom, go time. And then I typically go to bed. What you're saying is like, what's wrong about this though? I mean, this is what people I think really love about your list. I am really happy at the quality bar of my email. I'm just not happy about consistency in terms of like timing. Okay. Uh, somebody once said that I should just not make promises about timelines. Just say, you know, you get emails from me occasionally, which that would be more true than the total lie that I will send you one to two emails a month. In terms of achieving consistent results for the business and also getting more consistent mindset with people, like I think that establishing a consistent expectation of, you know, every other Friday would probably make it even more appreciated than it is already. I agree. And you can see that sometimes in like the podcasting world. Like podcasts also something I do on a very occasional basis. Rob Walling and Mike Tabor, you know, Every Tuesday, come hell or high water, Startups for the Rest of Us comes out. That's integrated into my Tuesday plan. And that's integrated into thousands of other people's Tuesday plan. So I got two more questions in the meat of this. And then if you have a few extra minutes, I'd like to ask you some sort of potpourri questions, things you're sure. interested about. But I'm curious as to what podcasts and blogs you currently learn from. Maybe mm-hmm. not the ones that are all time most, because I think we can kind of get an idea from that from your blog. But like, What's inspiring you and educating you and keeping you moving along right now? Like, what do you look at on the web and what do you listen to? There's a bit of can't go back into the same river twice here. The blogs that were big and up and coming back when I was up and coming in like the 2006, 2008, 2010 range are in some cases like they're not actively maintained now or they're for a variety of reasons they're not as useful in 2014 as they used to be. Joel Spolstein's blog was the place to be for software entrepreneurs yeah. you know, back in 2008. Sadly, he stepped away from writing that. This is embarrassing, but I don't have a single go-to blog for software entrepreneurs at present, like not a one. Occasionally, you know, a good isolated article will come up on Hacker News, but actually, I lied. <laughs> There's one good blog that's you know current for software people. It's for a specific slice of software people. If enterprise sales is important to you, you should read everything on the Saster, S-A-A-S-T-R dot com blog. Man, it looks like it was written by a fifth grader in like 1996. Power past that. Everything you need to know about like running a sales team, writing commission structures, yada, yada, is on that blog in some way way, shape or form. But it's a very different model than the one that most people in our space use. Now, in terms of podcasts. Let me just inject. We'll link to all these. This is going to be at tropicalmba.com slash Patrick. That's our pretty URL if you want to go get all the links to everything that Patrick's mentioned so far. So podcast wise, obviously, I listen to your guys podcast a lot. Startups for the rest of us by Rob Walling and Mike Tabor. I think that's probably the best one for people who are like me in the SaaS business. There's one that I started listening to recently called Conversion Aid Podcast. Basically, he's been doing interview shows with a lot of SaaS companies from the like slightly bigger than me to quite a bit bigger than me space. Mm -hmm. So it's folks that I look up to in a lot of ways, and they're really a good combination of actionable advice and here's our business story, here's what we did right, here's what we did wrong kind of things. 
Speaking of actual advice, this is my last question for kind of the work section, then we'll get to the play sections. You in your talks at conferences are famous for giving like actionable things that people can just go do that like kind of like makes the talk worth it for them. And one of the things that you mentioned, you learned with one of your clients that if you put like a ridiculous play button on your video, people are like way more likely to click it. Like a ridiculously large play button that is. And that really stuck in my mind. I was like, wow, yep. I would have never thought of that. Like so big that it's dumb looking, right? Are there other conversion quick wins like that or email quick wins that you could leave the audience with today that they could do on their sites that, that would make a difference? I've got two for you, one for email and one for conversions. So the two biggest things that are worth working on immediately for conversion optimization are the title on your pages. What you want to do there is specific to what the page is attempting to do, so I won't address that for the moment. But the other one is your call to action. So if that's the button title for getting someone to sign up for your email address, if it's the button for getting them to start a free trial, whatever. A joke that I've made, which is somewhat off color, but people always laugh, so I'll make it again. The only time you should have submit on a button is if you run an SNM site. Most people don't associate that with getting value. So rather than having submit or sign up or start trial as your call to action, you should have something which promises value, preferably value immediately. So get my free blah, start blahing now, start blahing today, yada, yada, and uh, tend to outperform by quite a bit. And that's a tend to kind of thing, A-B tested if you don't believe me. See, I told you that I'd give you one for email too. Taking the observation that making things as low touch as possible is not the way forward for most people who are like us. Try to inject a little bit of personality into that first email that you send people. I love talking about this with you know people in our space and I would love to talk to you about it. If you have a question about blah, write me back, just hit reply and you know we'll talk. This is obviously something that there's only certain business models that are conducive to this, but if you're you know the typical B2B SaaS company and your lifetime value is in the thousands of dollars, then it is absolutely to your advantage to start as many meaningful conversations about you know your product slash customers slash space as possible. So I would encourage absolutely everybody who gets on your email list to start a human conversation with you as early as possible. One clarification on the title tags. Do you mean the H1 tags? What can you do there? I mean, I think, for example, on my product page for valet podiums, I say buy valet podiums at the valet spot. Is that what you're talking about? That was what I was talking about. Uh, People are looking at that in the tab and that impacts their behavior on the site. Or are you talking about going from the SERPs into the site? Not the SERPs, not the title tag, but the H1, the large like title-like object on the middle of the page. I generally tend to make that something that is attention-grabbing and specific to the user's pain point. So rather than saying, you know, buy valet podiums at the valet spot, I might try something like, this would require me to have some insight into what parking management companies actually care about in life. But let's say, you know, reduce employee theft with a a law podium by... Or, you know, get your new location up and running in 48 hours. Right. They don't want to buy a podium. They want to get their location open. Right. So lead with the benefits rather than the features. Also lead with the benefits in such a way that somebody can quickly select whether I'm interested in reading the rest of this page or not. So, okay, that's the business end of things. Now I'm going to push it through the hour for like true McKenzie diehards because I have a bunch more questions (laughs) I want to learn about. So you kind of have a reputation for giving pretty epic conference talks. And I've been to a lot of conferences and like, I almost want to say most talks suck. So how do you make your talks consistently not suck? So I think this is a multi-part answer. (laughs) Number one, I have an unfair advantage where it's like, you know, some kids growing up trying to play football. I actually have quite a bit of a speech impediment, which might not be that obvious these days, but it was really obvious back in like middle school. And so as behavioral therapy for the speech impediment, I started to do public speaking as like a quote unquote sport. I continued that through middle school, high school, college, and a bit into points beyond. If you think of like your stereotypical Jack in high school who like his entire life revolves around being able to run really, really efficiently with a pigskin in his hand, 15 years of my life was devoted to the craft of speaking well. So that helps. In terms of what people can do like without having to dial yourself back to middle school and give yourself a speech impediment to become much better at conference presentations, I would suggest, number one, thinking who you're giving the presentation to. I bomb on talks too, just like everybody else does if they give a lot of them. Every time I bomb on a talk, it's because I did not kind of do my homework for the audience I was giving it to. And I gave them something that was inappropriate to where their businesses were or what their personal concerns were. I won't name the conference, but uh, there was one I got flown out to once and I got back the evaluations. I scored like on a scale of one to 100, like a 45, slightly below their average for speakers. And I called up the organizer to apologize. And he said, well, you know, 
that's what the word average means. We have some speakers who are above average and some who are below average. I'm like, well, F if I'm ever going to fly out to a country to give a below average talk. My aim is always to like be one of the top two or three at the conference, which means get in the head of the people that you're going to be speaking to. And remember, the talk is not about you. It's about them. So figure what they need to get out of the talk and then give that to them, which with just enough sugar in terms of like the, you know, having a good presentation style, nice rapport with the audience, some funny story or whatnot to start things off. It's like the sugar that I use to get people to accept the tactical goodness. Why do you think people are so bad at it? Why do you think people are consistently so bad at developing these talks for conferences? Many reasons for that. One reason is that like, particularly if you go to a lot of conferences with a sales agenda, you know, somebody is giving a presentation about a CRM because fundamentally they want to sell CRMs. And so, yeah, I'm going to give you a presentation and how to sell more of whatever it is you sell. Sell more value podiums. But the presentation is really about selling you the CRM software. Right. That presentation is always going to suck. <laughs> and I've sat through my fair share of those, and I very, very rarely find one that is good at that. I'll give you an example of somebody who he gives presentations, like there is a business purpose for his company for giving the presentations, and yet he delivers outstanding value to the people who listen in. If he's not in your radar screens, guys, yet, like watch this guy because he's going places. His name is Ryan Delkin, he works at Gumroad. And Gumroad is the site that lets you sell information products over the internet, basically. Mm -hmm. And Ryan does a like canned one hour presentation, how to sell information products better. Gumroad is only mentioned at like two points, you know, hey, I'm from Gumroad, here's what it does. And then at the end, you know, Gumroad email address. In between is like, we have, you know, 1 billion data points on selling info products on the internet. Here's what you can do in terms of pricing, in terms of packaging, in terms of tier structure, in terms of relative price between the structure, in terms of email promotion. Here's the value of an email <laughs> hit versus a, versus a click on Twitter, blah, 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 blah. Here's what a successful creator did. Here's how he did it more successful in a second launch. Here was his long-term game for turning it from a launch into a renewal process. Boom, 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 value, value, value. Any questions? Wow. And A, like, I'm pretty good at this. I learn stuff from Ryan every time I see that presentation. I've seen essentially the same presentation three times. B, I will guarantee you that he gets results for his company doing that because, you know, anybody who walks away from that is like, I don't know what I just saw, but I have a feeling it was awesome. <laughs> and I want to be in any position which gets me access to that guy. If I have to buy Gumroad to do that, I will buy Gumroad. What is it again? Yeah, whatever. One of the things that's emerging for me is I was going to ask you this question. Like many years ago, you've always like swung above your weight in terms of like getting invited to present to audiences. Like you were on Mixergy when your business generated $30,000 a year. You got invited to Google. You took down the house at the Business of Software Conference. I still watch that just for laughs sometimes. I mean, it's hilarious. You're, the Old Spice parody is, I'm definitely <laughs> looking to that. I'd be curious about the backstory of that talk, by the way. But how do you get invited to all these things? Maybe we answered our own question, which is like, most people suck at this. So just being good at this is an incredible advantage. But I'm just curious as to your idea of like, how do you get invited to these? You know, the benefits you get out of it, why you spend a lot of energy doing this kind of work. I'll give you the full story for the business of software one because the business of software presentation in 2010 kind of like quote unquote made my speaking career. So that was the Old Spice presentation. You can find it on the internet. Well, it'll be linked up in the show notes. And it's hilarious. Uh, so they had an open call for presentations. The business of software presentation was the only time I've ever responded to an open call for presentations. And it was probably the only time I ever needed to because after that, people came to me. So A, you know, I was trying to make a sale to Mark, the guy who runs this conference. So I tried to get into Mark's head. Mark runs a conference and that is his business. That's how he makes money to feed his family. What does he care about? He must care about two things. Number one, he wants to sell tickets for this year. Number two, he wants to sell tickets for next year as a result of how his conference performed this year. Do I have like a certain amount of name value that I can say, hey, people will come to the conference just to watch me talk at the time? Candidly, not so much, but I had a blog, which was fairly well received in software circles. So I led it with, hey, Mark, I'd like the opportunity to talk at your conference this year. My name is Patrick McKenzie. I have a blog that's very well received in software circles. And here's some other social proof which says that people think that I'm not a total idiot. I, like, I helped moderate Joel Spolsky's forum, yada, yada, yada. I wanted to convince him that I didn't say in as many words, like, this is going to sell more tickets for you next year. I said, I'm going to do a topical presentation which people will talk about after the conference. It's going to address something of importance in the community that's not controversial. It's not going to blow up in your face. Something that there could be a little bit of buzz about. And it's going to be a great presentation to listen to. When I wrote that, I knew I was going to talk about marketing to women, but I did not have the Old Spice Guy thing at all at that point. And then I spent a month of work on that presentation and made it really, really effing good. It was yeah. effing good. <laughs> there is very little substitute for actually like doing the work. I had it like practiced down to the nines. 
and then realized once I got to Boston that I had practiced for the wrong format and had to totally rewrite the presentation the day before. Oh boy, that was fun. But gave a really good talk that a little bit of a feather in my cap, not meaning to brag, but this did happen. Somebody who reps like professional conference speakers, that was apparently a thing that exists, even though I've never taken a dollar for it, got in touch with me a few weeks later and said, if you want to do this speech as like a gig, I can start getting you gigs for 15% of what you charge for speech. And that would probably be like 10,000 bucks a speech. Wow. Like, oh, that sounds very interesting for somebody who's not me, but <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, that's how I got into the business software thing. Amy Hoy has a really great article back in the day on stacking the bricks. It's an article slash video on uh, how people that have impressively large professional reputations did not suddenly like spring from Zeus's forehead with an impressively large professional reputation. They started with nothing. They did one thing. And they did one thing that built in that one thing. And then they kept going like that for a while. And, you know, you stack one brick at a time and eventually you have a wall. The wall did not just arrive there. It happened because of the stacking of the bricks. And I think that's like sort of where I am on the conference thing. I have a lot of unfair advantages as compared to somebody who might be listening to this podcast in 2014. But I don't want you to get the impression that you can't do it. No, you just go out there, get your hands dirty, put down one brick, and put down another brick. And then, you know, six years from now, people will be asking you, how did you come to be you know, internet famous like that? And you're like, oh, it's just actually just doing the work. I mean, you must get so much pressure. I can't remember if it was on, you know, your Mixer G episode or one other, where, you know, people see your wall kind of taking shape and they want to put their bricks in your wall or they think that you're <laughs> building it wrong. And I mean, you have must have gotten tons of flack from these startup guys over the years, like, yet you seem to be consistently confident about doing it your own way. Part of that is the ability to project confidence, but I don't necessarily have it internally, <laughs> which is a useful skill, by the way, in uh, life, the universe, and everything. Part of that is just a little bit of a thick skin which helps on the internet. I have uh, a condition my father characterized as Irish Alzheimer's, which is I forget everything except every time that someone has done me wrong. So there's actually somewhere in this apartment a notebook with basically every bad thing that's ever been said about me. So when something bad gets said, I write it down in a notebook and then take particular glee in writing a smiley face next to it when I've proven that person wrong. So I'll give you the first thing that's on that page. Uh, there's nine entries or so. The first thing is that I don't know why this kid who is writing about some crappy bingo card software is getting, I was on the business of software forum back in the day, it's getting written about on the business of software forum because clearly that's not going anywhere. Smiley face. And... <laughs> And then there's like another one. It's like, yeah, well, come back to me when appointment reminder is selling six figures a year. Money face. And, you know, a bunch of things like that, which is a little small minded of me, but I get disproportionate glee out of it. <laughs> I love it. That's the episode so, bumper right there. <laughs> hey, what conferences are you going to go to this year? You know a lot about conferences. Where are you going to head out to? So, dependent on my family schedule, my wife and I just had a little baby. So, harking back a little bit to things that matter to you. Um, my family matters to me quite a bit. So, I would sacrifice absolutely anything about my business and go back to being a salary man if necessary for them. Uh, so, that little disclaimer out of the way. I will probably be at the MicroConf, wherever Rob Wallen holds that. I would go to the dark side of the moon if necessary. <laughs> I'm trying to, like I've been advocating a few years for MicroConf Tokyo. There needs to be something in Asia for it. I would like to get out to your guys' conference next year if possible. And I wanted to go this year, but you were literally contra programmed against the birth of my daughter. So sorry. <laughs> and then Bacon Biz by Amy Hoy. And then I try to get out to business of software every year. So let's see, that's four for a year. That seems like a good number for me. But if somebody has a really compelling pitch on why I should go to a different one, please uh, drop me an email. Can you describe Amy's event a little bit? I don't know much about it. Sure. It's a conference for people like me who either uh, run software applications or do information marketing of some sort, largely information marketing to technical people. A very small, very intimate event, 50 people of whom, you know, between 10 and 15 will be presenting. So it's like kind of a everybody gets to talk to everybody else, information exchange kind of thing. That's really what I like about conferences. Like I've been to big ones and the small ones. I like a conference where I can have a meaningful conversation with everybody at the conference if I want to and if they want to. So I want to shift gears and talk a little bit about Japan. If you have a little bit of energy left, I don't know if you need to take a drink of water or anything. I'm... I have virtually infinite energy. So okay. like I could run my own mouth off for several hours in a row, unfortunately. And I've been told on my podcast I do. Well, good. So I got... <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you to indulge us with a little bit of bio, because I've heard 
your rationale for relocating to Japan. And I thought it was interesting. So if you could take us back to your mindset. Part of the reason I think it jumped out at me is because you said that you didn't have faith in your abilities as a software engineer. Throughout our conversation, and generally you talk a lot about you're a sharp strategic thinker, you know, positioning your apps, your business, your skill set for success. So can you kind of take us back and walk us through why you moved to Japan basically with no previous knowledge of the country? I originally had the idea of coming to Japan after college. I had studied Japanese in university because I thought I knew I wanted to do engineering, but the Wall Street Journal, which I had grown up on my father's knee reading, the Wall Street Journal was saying all the engineering jobs are going to India and China. I thought, oh God, my job will go to India and China without me. So I have to do one other thing such that I'm better at engineering than everybody who can do that other thing, and I'm better at that other thing than anybody who can do engineering. I thought, well, foreign languages are typically really difficult. I'd studied Spanish for a while in high school, and that was really hard. So if I find a foreign language where learning that foreign language is good in, in the software industry, if I become you know, one of the very few engineers in America who speaks that foreign language, then I will have a job in the intersection of engineering plus that foreign language for the rest of my life. And when I was looking down the list of languages my university offered, uh, Japanese was easily the best candidate. Uh, Japanese companies spend billions of dollars every year on U.S. software. Very few Americans speak Japanese. Essentially, no Japanese engineers speak English. Seems like a match made in heaven. I thought, okay, I'm going to go to Japan for a few years. Obviously, I studied it for three years in school. I got decent at conversational Japanese. I'm going to go to Japan for a few years, firm up my business Japanese, come home and get a job. I had this circled in a newspaper. Like There was a solicitation for the Japanese-speaking manager of Microsoft Excel. Like That is the job I will have. You know, Product manager, MS Excel, Japanese version. Boom and nobody will ever be able to take that job away from me. So that was the plan. Came out to Japan, really liked living in the little town, Ogaki, where I was living. Didn't quite love working at the company I was working at, but you know the plan was always to go back and get a job at Microsoft. And then after three years, the plan changed. Okay, I'm gonna stay here a little while longer because I like living here, but then I'm gonna go get a job at, then it was uh, Google. It's going to be the Japanese speaking product manager for Google products. And <laughs> funny, three years after I like printed out the Google webpage that had that job opening on it, printed it out, circled it on red, and put it on my wall so that every day when I was sitting down to play World of Warcraft, would see on the wall, like the long-term goal. That was literally hanging on my wall for the best part of three years. Some years after I hung that on my wall, Google offered me that exact job. And by that time it was like, F no, why would I ever want to do that? Which is funny, like life is what happens to you when you're making other plans, right? Yeah, the entrepreneurship thing kind of took over my professional life. People give me credit as a strategic thinker. I think partly that's a little bit because I'm uh, you know, smarter than the average bear partly because I communicate well. And so if people think that stuff is a little more genius when I try to explain what I'm doing, then there is necessarily strategy involved. (laughs) Partly because I'm willing to be wrong fearlessly. (laughs) Well, not fearlessly. I'm a nervous wreck when doing it. But I ship a lot of things that don't work well. Ship a lot of experiments where, you know, it doesn't get a 10% improvement to conversion rates. It kills them by 30%. Uh, Appointment reminder was my second product. It was actually my third attempt at a second product. There's two others that basically nobody even remembers the name of that I got halfway through writing and then decided to kill off for various reasons because I thought there wasn't a market there. And despite all these failures and half starts and whatnot, I have a modestly successful business and a bit of a profile of that. What is it that you like about Japan or love about it? And what got into your system about it and kept you there? And if there was somebody else in your shoes, do you think ultimately that your strategy was a good one? Do you think it could work for somebody else? Part of the bloody mindedness in me wants to say that I was totally right. The combination of learning foreign language plus doing engineering is a great effing combination. Still believe that's true. What got into my head about Japan? It was particularly about Ogaki, the town I used to be living in. I lived 10 years of my life in Ogaki. I thought I was going to grow old and die in Ogaki. I love that town so much. My wife had other ideas, which is why we're currently living in Tokyo, but that's another discussion altogether. Something about the combination of pace of life, people being almost cliche, but so nice. You know, nice combination of like Japanese politeness plus small town American values. The air was clean, the water was bubbly, the trees were bright and green. Man, I even like the smell of that town. Walking to the train station in the morning, there was this kind of like the murmur of honest commerce on Main Street as I was walking to the station in the morning. It's something that was like emotionally affecting to me. I love that town. That town happened to be in the middle of Japan. And if that town was the middle of Kansas, I would probably be living in the middle of Kansas right now. That said, 
currently in Tokyo. Uh, it turns out Tokyo is a much better place to live than I thought it was going to be. I thought it had, you know, all of the classic huge metropolitan area problems that I had run away from. It turns out people here are quite nice. There's, you know, a little slice of small town life that you can carve out in the middle of Tokyo, as long as you stay far away from the subways and don't try to ride them during rush hour. <laughs> like people in a sardine can, it's crazy. One of the nice things about Tokyo is that there is a bit of a entrepreneur community slash a technology community here where there was not really an ogaki. It is like one of the reasons I spent so much time writing over the years and participating on message boards and going to conferences was otherwise I would be a total recluse because obviously my business is also kind of a hobby to me. Aside from my like personal friends in Ogaki, I would never talk to anybody other than like a cashier at the supermarket. <laughs> if I was only talking to people who understood like, hey, you want to discuss SaaS applications and email marketing strategies? Nandaro soy, sorry, uh, by little pun. Anyhow, yeah, now I live in Tokyo. Kind of nice for the last couple of weeks. My wife likes it here because it's a big city and she feels it's a better place to raise a child in a way that they'll get good education and not be quite as ostracized by the being half Japanese, half American problem as there would be in Ogaki, which hmm. could potentially be an issue. Okay, so I have uh, a few questions about that. I recently went to Japan for the first time and I really had a wonderful time. I read a lot about it on the internet and Japan seems to have a lot of haters. Like there's posts about like Japanese culture or whatever and then you'll see like all these foreigners going in there talking smack. So I'm curious about your view on that. Japan is a country in much the same way as the United Kingdom is a country or France is a country or Somalia is a country. Now, that sounds like a vacuous statement, but it happens to be true. Every country has its own problems. I think the question of like haters on the internet is largely due to a sort of outsized participation that Japan has in American culture, of all things. Like, you know, the anime otaku squad, like it collects haters for the same reason that like comic books or Justin Bieber collects haters. <laughs> Fundamentally, I'm not making any consequential decisions for my life based on what some 15-year-old in his mother's basement thinks about Justin Bieber <laughs> or about Japan. Why are there so few foreigners in Japan? And what are the opportunities for foreigners who might want to move there like you did in terms of the business scene or entrepreneurial scene? Sure. So why are there so few foreigners in Japan? There's a variety of reasons for that. The Japanese language is a very forbidding barrier to entry. You probably experienced while you were here, although I think you might have been in Tokyo, which is a little easier than much of the rest of Japan on the score. But Japan is like optimized for Japanese language only for a lot of things. Yes. Uh, there's some bilingualism, kind of. There's been some great talk recently in the media about getting everything fixed in time for 2020 for the massive influx of foreigners for the Olympics. And that's going to happen the first day after never. Um, <laughs> so Japanese language, barrier to entry. The fact that you kind of have to like affirmatively select into being interested in Japan in the U.S. where you wouldn't to be like interested in, say, Spanish or French or German. You'll be made fun of it in some circles. In other circles, you won't be made fun of it, but you'll be pushed in a direction which is not conducive to business interests. Like, oh man, this is maddening to me, but anime? I like anime in a way that like I can, you know, like Spider-Man or like Star Trek without necessarily having to organize my life around it. But in America, like the Japan-oriented community of interest, they like anime in a way that is different than the way that I just described. And as you go down that road, you get progressively farther and farther from nice, responsible adults who can work in a civil society. And man, I had to interview folks like that for my old day job. Are you talking about like Japanophiles? Yeah, anime, otaku, yada yada. Mm -hmm. Like imagine there's me interviewing on behalf of a Japanese megacorp. We've flown somebody from America to Japan to interview for a job and he starts speaking in broken totally non-fluent samurai japanese that's what he had picked up from the anime it's <laughs> like think of like you're at google hiring manager at google and you're hiring someone who you've flown in from tokyo for the interview and he's talking in broken hip-hop english Yo, full shizzle that rest in the face. Booyah. <laughs> and my, my face was like, uh, make it stop, make it stop. You can't be yeah. like halfway into Japan, right? Like you can't just stop off there for a couple months a year. It's, it seems to me like I mean, you have to make an investment if you want to go there. It doesn't seem like there's a particularly bright startup scene there right now. Would that be I true? would not describe it as a particularly bright startup scene either. It's funny, like my sense of your guys' audience is there's folks who fly around between Thailand and Vietnam and the Philippines and yada yada and might spend six weeks in one and three months in the other. I do not find folks often include Japan on that itinerary, partly because it's ridiculously expensive as opposed to Southeast Asia. 
That's yeah. not true. Not ridiculously expensive, but it's... It's way more affordable than I thought it was going to be, especially <laughs> for rent. I was blown away by how low the rents are because you think Tokyo is going to be, oh, it's going to be like San Francisco rents. So no, not even close. Right, I don't think anywhere is like San Francisco rents. <laughs> so I had the same impression that you did prior to moving out to Tokyo. I thought Tokyo would be the most expensive city anywhere. I live, not to toot my own horn, I live in a very, very nice apartment in the Japanese folks love lists. I'm in the number two neighborhood in Tokyo to live in, like in terms of, you know, hot real estate rankings for this year, in one of the nicer apartments in it. And it's $3,000 a month, which will get you, you know, a cockroach infested half of a bed in the mission these days. That's a San Francisco neighborhood. You know, if you go 10 minutes out in either direction, you can find places that are like 1500 bucks or whatnot. So yeah, kind of agree with it's a bit of an investment if you want to set up a life here the japanese language most of all cultural fluency a little bit let's see in terms of the startup scene i just wrote a big blog post about this so i won't recount all of it um in general i think that uh, japan is not exactly optimized towards being very conducive for japanese people to get exposed to the notion of running a business for themselves or joining another new small business uh, i think that's changing but slowly i expect it to change faster than i expect the country to change from being like a japanese language only to japanese and english on equal footing because that's just total pie in the sky but you can actually see like you know facts on the ground changing with regards to like the social acceptability of doing your own thing versus working for a megacorp but it's slow um, it's certainly not san francisco in terms of a entrepreneurial scene or even you know a chicago or a philadelphia in terms of an entrepreneurial scene i want to point people to your doing business in japan article i only have one more question okay <laughs> myself right now, but this article is it's fabulous it's wonderful to read it really brings us into your world i really think that like this is what makes the internet great for me like sitting down and like <laughs> Like seen through your eyes on the ground. There's no like corporate agenda behind this content or something. I'm just like, I get a window into your world and it's 10,000 words long. It obviously took you a long time to create. Can you talk a little bit about the creation process and from your experience, what are your expectations for the performance of a piece like that in terms of like, how is that going to affect your life? Are you going to meet a lot of people in Tokyo because of that? Are you going to get business opportunities because of that? Or, you know, what's going to come down the road for a kind of a, you'd say like a cornerstone piece like that. So if you kind of talk us through that piece and then the listeners can go read it and get an idea of what your world is like in Japan. Sure. So this blog post was 10,000 words long, which is actually only a little bit longer than my posts usually are. My sweet spot is between 4,000 and 8,000 words. Like there's plenty of places to get short content on the internet. So if you don't have an attention span longer than 500 words, well, we can't be friends. <laughs> like people, every time I write an email, somebody will write me back saying, this is awesome, but it's like 10 times longer than what I'm prepared to read. I'm like, great. I can recommend BuzzFeed. Have a nice day. Um, I don't say it quite like that. But that's what I think about it. Like I used to write the, the short stuff too, but the long stuff performed much better and was my best work. For my personal look at it, Like it was the stuff I was proudest about writing. It got the most engagement from people. People cited it the most when, in terms of like things I wrote that actually produced value for them. So these days I write basically long form and that's it. This a little bit longer than usual. Typically for me, an article takes a solid day to write. This took about 20 hours over four days. Uh, the reason it took a little while longer than usual was uh, the first draft of it was very emotionally raw. The article starts with my anecdotes about working like a salary man. And that was a significant chapter in my life that lasted for about three years and was very difficult for me. And I did not want it, the article to be a, a cynical thing talking about a job that had driven me to the brink of breaking and beyond. So I did a couple of tone edits to make it a little more neutral and like, you know, hey, there's some great things about living here. The startup scene is mixed, which is my true opinion, not totally a disaster. Here's the pluses and minuses of that. And here's how you can go about thinking about it for yourself. So in terms of results, this article, day one traffic was higher than any article I've ever gotten, which was a pleasant surprise. When I write a 10,000 word article about something that I know I'm an expert in and that fills a hole in the internet, I have a certain expectation these days that it's going to do pretty well. I didn't know it was going to do that well. It's gotten 50,000 visitors or so, so far. In terms of impact to my business, something I could have predicted prior to writing it, pretty low. Uh, stuff on the blog, the main business impact it has these days, because I'm not doing consulting on a regular basis anymore, is how many folks that it drives to my email list. And since this is a little off my beaten path and didn't really have a strong call to action for joining my email list, I've gotten maybe 90 signups as a result of it which is the amount of signups I would get if I just went to sleep for the next two weeks <laughs> or played League of Legends for the next two weeks. It might get me folks that I've been seeing around Tokyo have mentioned it to me virtually every time I've seen someone in Tokyo for the last two weeks, but that's not necessarily you know something that will make or break my end of the year numbers. 
But I wasn't really writing it to make or break my end of the year numbers. It was just something that intellectually interesting to me. I know I have a advantage on this particular topic versus 99.8% of people who will ever read my blog. So I thought uh, I w- would like to get this written for somewhere. Put a few breadcrumbs on the internet for someone who can make use of them later. And if, you know, six years from now I bump into someone in Japan who said, yeah, I got my start here as a result of reading that article, that would make my day six years from now. And if I don't, yeah, it's two full work days of my life. I've wasted them playing League of Legends before. This is a lot more productive than doing that. (laughs) It's interesting. I have a similar experience with, I have a little hack to teach people how to play the guitar. I would teach my friends how to play the guitar in 10 hours. That was my thing. One day, I just like, instead of watching NBA clips on YouTube, I wrote an article about it. And to this day, it has been seen by way more people than all of my other articles combined. For me, that's my number one, two performing articles are the one on salary negotiation, which is at least arguably in my field. And then the other one is about falsehoods programmers believe about names. And it's a combination of technical slash social interest. And a lot of people care about it very deeply. But it's something that will basically never sell a single copy of any piece of software ever. But it gets more links put up to it than everything else I've written combined. Well, speaking of intellectually interesting and long form, this was certainly both. I think this is the longest interview I've ever done, but it's been a long time coming for me. I've wanted to talk to you about all these topics. So thank you for sticking around and sharing with all of us. We'll have everything linked up for listeners. I mean, there's a gazillion links that we mentioned. So I'll spend some extra energy on this post and ensure that people can get in touch with you and they can follow up on all the references. we Anyway, I just wanted to thank you so much for dropping by, Patrick, and sharing your wealth of knowledge. Thanks so much for having me, Dan. If any of you guys want to chit-chat, my email address will be linked up in the notes. I love talking to folks in our industry. Cheers. Hey, thanks for listening to the Tropical MBA podcast. You can go to tropicalmba.com, get access to hundreds of back episodes and all kinds of other goodies. Load up your iPod. That is the cheapest way to fly business class on your next international flight. We will see you next Thursday morning. 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time.